Hi, I'm Jeremy Kaplan. I'm thrilled to be able to share some thoughts with you about moving from this era of digital transformation towards a new era of digital sustainability. I want to share with you some thoughts on how we can not just survive, but thrive in the new journalism ecosystem. We've been at this process for quite some time now, and we're on the third step here. We started in the mid 90s, moving online for the first time with new websites, then moving into the mobile and social era in the mid 2000s with the launch of the first iPhone in 2007 and the early growth of Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and other social platforms in that period. And now we're in this third key phase, the third step on the way to new sustainability in this digital era, focusing on business sustainability and new business models for news. And that's what I want to share with you uh, for this uh, presentation. I am no stranger to this world of media, just like all of you. I, work, I worked at uh, Time Magazine, a, a news organization uh, which was fighting for its survival and, and for its sustainability. And to move from this era of, of initial transformation towards sustainability. I now run the Journalism Creators Program at the City University of New York's Graduate School of Journalism, where I work with journalists from around the world, independent journalists, to help them build new sustainable micro ventures, niche ventures. So these are projects like newsletters, podcasts, new niche websites around the world. And we've been exploring new ways to create products, new ways to distribute those products and services, and new ways to monetize and help journalists become more sustainable. I also write a newsletter called Wonder Tools. So I'm thinking very much about this new era and how to develop new products and services for, for journalism and for other fields and uh, how we can work more efficiently and creatively and, and develop new business models. There are no shortage of challenges that we face in this era. There are tremendous obstacles in front of us that we are having to confront and will continue to have to confront in the years ahead. First of all, there's declining interest in some of what we do and some of the journalism that we create. Interest in news in many countries is falling. And when we, when we ask people, are you interested in news? Um, how interested are you? we see declining numbers. And you can see the number here for Brazil declining from 82% in 2015 all the way down to 57% in 2022. And that's similar to the numbers in these other countries as well. We also see, in addition to declining interest, we see growing avoidance, active avoidance of, of news and journalism. And the people, the percentage of people who say they're actively avoiding news has, has grown significantly um, between 2017 and 2022. In Brazil and in the UK, in the US, many other countries, we see growing numbers, uh, in this case, growing from 34% in 2019 in Brazil to 54% of people say they often or sometimes avoid the news. And it's true in the U.S. people say that made-up news uh, causes them great confusion. So they're actively avoiding news because they're just confused about it. This is a quote from someone in the U.K. saying that they avoid news because it makes them feel small and they feel like their views won't make any difference. Another person said that news triggers their anxiety and it has a negative impact on their day. So people are feeling like they just don't want some of what we provide to them in journalism. There are a lot of other reasons people provide. They say it has a negative effect on their mood. They say they can't do anything with the information we give them. It's not actionable or useful or relevant to them in some cases. And sometimes people find it just confusing. They're not sure why there's this battle going on between, the, between Russia and the Ukraine, or they're not sure what the situation at the moment is in Syria or in some other part of the world where there's some conflict going on, and, and that causes them to feel disconnected from the journalism that we're creating in some cases. And you can see the number here um, is sig significant, for particularly for those under 35 years old. 
And when asked how interested, if at all, would you say you are in news, um, that, that number is just continuing to decline. Uh, and part of it's because the number of journalists there to explain things to people is declining, right? We have 51% drop in, in newsroom employment in U.S. newspapers uh, since 2008. And if there are fewer journalists around to explain things, it's, it's harder to do that job effectively as, a, as an organization. In many places in, around the world, including in the U.S., including in Latin America and Europe and Asia, there are increasingly places that just don't have quality news available. You see here the areas in red are news deserts without any newspapers, and those in yellow just have one newspaper. And this similar picture is true in, in many countries, as the fortunes of, of many media organizations are, are suffering. Many in, in various parts of the world, including Europe, aren't reading the news every day anymore. Uh, some never read the news. And in some cases, it's because of declining trust. So people don't necessarily trust what we're offering to them in some cases. Uh, in the case of COVID, many people trust many other sources rather than journalists. And in the case of, of other topics, uh, people are, are really skeptical about journalists and what we're, what we're publishing. This is a, a, some data about Brazil in particular, and you can see the trust score has declined over time from 62% back in 2015 to 48%. And uh, the extent to which people say it's, un, it's free of undue influence, that in other words, we're independent, is also is declining. And across a variety of these outlets, these news outlets, people feel less likely to trust uh, news than they had in the past. So this is a, a problem. And it's a problem, again, not just in Brazil or in the US. Uh, it's a problem in Europe. It's a problem in parts of Africa and Asia. And uh, many people are really skeptical uh, of what they read. And, and appropriately so in some cases, given the amount of misinformation that is coming through various channels that people are using to consume news and information. In some cases, people don't understand how we actually operate. They don't understand where our money comes from, who we are loyal to, how we find sources, how we do the reporting that we do. We haven't always done as well as we could to be transparent about how journalism works and how news and information actually work. And that's resulted in, in a diminishment of trust in some cases. And finally, we have business challenges. And these are significant. People aren't necessarily willing to pay for news in some cases. And they're eager to pay for their Netflix, Netflix subscription, their Spotify subscriptions, their even audiobooks have, have been on the rise in, in, uh, in terms of sales during the pandemic. Sports, uh, people are willing to subscribe to. But you can see here, illustrated here in the Reuters Institute data, where much of this data is from the 2022 Reuters report. And you can see here declining uh, or, or rel relative um, diminishment of new subscriptions relative to, to other media forms. People do pay for news in various parts of the world, um, but it is leveling off. The growth has diminished a little bit of late, uh, with, with some exceptions, uh, like in Sweden, Australia, uh, Austria, and Germany. But in, in much of the world, we, we've leveled off at around 17% in, in, uh, in terms of how, what percentage of people are actually paying for, for news. And when people do pay, they often pay for one particular outlet. So that's the sort of winner take all kind of scenario where people pay for, for something, they pay for online news, but they pay for only one or maybe two outlets in some places like Australia and the US. And that means that if you're not that one outlet, it can be challenging. Um, and it can be challenging for local outlets as well as for other kinds of niche publications. In Australia, that challenge has been real in terms of declining revenues across formats. And that's true across the world. That's just one example. Uh, Google and Facebook, uh, Amazon, have, uh, have really captured a significant portion of digital ad revenue. So in addition to people's limited willingness to pay, uh, the advertising revenue has also been in, in steep decline. And that's not a new problem. That's been happening over uh, the past couple of decades. And it's really a significant decline in ad revenue, which makes it more of a, of a challenge given limited willingness to pay for subscriptions in some cases. Finally, we have the problem of news interference. And the Reporters Without Borders map of press freedom around the world shows that there are a lot of places where journalists are continuing, continually 
interfered with or facing censorship or even violence in some cases. And this is a real threat to, to the sustainability of, of journalism because if journalists aren't safe and able to do their job freely, they won't be able to create a, a, a quality and sustainable product. In various parts of the world, people are really worried about this, uh, particularly in, in places like Greece and Italy, Bulgaria, Hungary, where there's not as much freedom as there as there is in, in other places, other parts of the world like Finland, D Netherlands, Denmark, etc. And uh, and this is something we should really keep an eye out f uh, and watch out for as it rises in, in many parts of the world. Part of it is because of the demagogues that we're now seeing take power in various countries. This is no mystery to all of us that increasingly we see these demagogues taking power and using that authority in some cases to squash media freedom or to question the legality of investigative reporting that they don't like. And this is true across borders and, and increasingly across the world. This has real dangerous implications for us in uh, stripping our democracies and something that really provides a significant threat. So we have declining interest uh, among some portions of our reading public and our viewing public and our listening public. We have growing avoidance, active avoidance in some cases. We have declining trust in some cases. And uh, we also face a variety of business challenges, which are significant and substantial, and even news interference by governments who don't want us to do the reporting that we are doing, don't want to hear uh, about the investigative reports that we're, we're developing, and, and want to diminish our our capacity to reach people with quality information. These are substantial challenges that we face. But news isn't going, to away, isn't going away. We are doing something that's been done for hundreds of years and storytelling, the storytelling that we do to, to help people understand their world around them isn't disappearing. It's facing new challenges but it's not disappearing. People need information. They need the stories that we're telling them. We, they need the information that we're providing about their lives and their communities and their work and their societies and their health. And they're going to continue needing that. People have access to news and information in so many different ways over the years, from rock art and book art to broadcast developing in the 20th century to digital in this new era. And that, that revolution in how people consume content and information, whether it's visual or, or in print, will continue to take place and will continue to move apace. There's always media with us. There's always journalism. It's just a question of how we actually navigate that and who survives and who doesn't and how we survive and what we can do to make that survival more, um, more vibrant, to, to help us survive and then to thrive beyond that survival. So media and journalism evolves, it changes, and it will continue to change at a very fast pace. In some cases, this works to our benefit. Axios just sold uh, recently to Cox Enterprises $525 million within five years of being founded. That's never happened in the history of, of journalism where a news organization was founded that quickly and sold for that amount of money. In many parts of the world, there's all kinds of new organizations that are growing and thriving, G7.hu in Hungary, um, Denik's, Denik N's uh, CRM in, in Slovakia has helped them really serve thousands and thousands of subscribers. They have detailed information about their subscribers. They're operating like a business and like a creative savvy business and growing and thriving because they're operating in a very savvy way, complementing quality journalism with effective business practices. Um, investment in some places is growing significantly for various kinds of technology companies and other kinds of companies. And in some cases, in some cases, in the creator ecosystem, for example, within journalism, we're seeing growing levels of investment, and that bodes well for opportunities to inject necessary cash and resources into news organizations where they're most needed. And in that creator ecosystem, we see one of the sparks, one of the points of light, one of the areas that signals that we have great opportunities going forward in the realm of journalism and sustainable journalism. We have to take some lessons from what creators are doing effectively. And I want to share some of these lessons from, from creators with a, a few examples. First, we have to be authentic. Here's an example of someone, Emily Atkin, who's tremendously authentic in her journalism, focusing on climate change in her case. 
She's writing about things that are happening day in, day out with an authentic voice, a personal voice, personal passion, as well as detail, as well as quality reporting. She's making this sustainable. So she has an excess now of 2,500 paid newsletter subscribers and a total revenue on an annualized basis of more than $175,000. Now, this is an individual journalist, but she provides a model for those of us in larger organizations about new kinds of products and services we can launch. Uh, in some cases, these independent journalists are opinionated. Some news organizations shy away from any type of opinion journalism. Others are, are exploring new ways to keep opinions separated and distinguished clearly from analysis. And I think that's an effective and smart approach. Lindsay Gibbs is someone who uses her personal opinion, her personal approach to do authoritative reporting that comes with a clear perspective. So she feels clearly that there's a, a strong presence of sexism in sports and professional sports leagues around the world. And she's reporting about how that influences sports around the globe. She's doing that quite well. She's already has a thousand uh, paid subscribers who are paying uh, about six dollars a month 72 us dollars a year and beginning to develop into a sustainable venture again this is the kind of topic that news organizations can take on and build into uh, their their portfolio of products and services we can rethink categories rather than focusing on news that is purely politics business sports weather etc we can take the approach of baratunde uh, thurston who really sees the intersection of race, technology, democracy, climate, other topics, and brings them to the fore in new and creative ways. He points out here that the world can be confusing, depressing, and overwhelming for many young people in particular, as well as older people. And so he's offering to help people make sense of that world. And I think that's a good approach. It's a strong approach. It's a compelling value proposition for people. And that's partly why he's been so successful in building this new independent venture. And other organizations, legacy media organizations, can take a, uh, take a bit of insight from this kind of approach that's working well. News organizations can see these independent creators as providing a kind of laboratory for new and interesting, innovative approaches. Some creators are also digging deep, showing how investigative journalism can be one of the paths forward for us. Popular Information by Judd Legum is a great newsletter focusing on investigating corruption, investigating malfeasance in the political sphere and in elections. He already has 138,000 paid subscribers um, and, uh, sorry, 138,000 overall subscribers, 5 to 10% of those pay. And um, he charges them about $50 a year. Um, it's voluntary, actually, because he doesn't want to exclude people who can't pay, which is an interesting point about ensuring that these aren't purely elitist publications, but in fact, anyone can access his his information, his reporting for free if they choose to or if they need to. And he keeps 87% of the revenue. This is one of the new appro approaches within the creator ecosystem within journalism. Substack keeps 10%, Stripe, the payment processor keeps 3%. And that adds up to revenue on, on a small for a small team of $300,000 per year. He reports on all kinds of important investigative uh, topics, uh, including the January 6th uprising in the U.S. and has done so very successfully. Other creators are getting narrow, like Nathan uh, Tankus, focusing on very specific brand uh, sections of monetary policy. And he has done very well with something called Crisis Notes, focusing on monetary policy. Others are running experiments using Web3, exploring new kinds of approaches to serving communities. Uh, Sherry Hu runs Water and Music dot com, which is a newsletter and research DAO, right? It's a distributed organization. So it's partly run by the readers and the community collectively runs a, a very successful discussion board on Discord where they gather together and provide each other information. And for that, they pay a membership fee. The membership fee um, is substantial and she has already 2,000 paying members. So this is proving to be a really interesting new model for a community that's coming together within a journalism publication to help each other gain relevant information, in this case, for about the sphere of, of the business of music. So people in that professional sphere, this is a very good example of kind of using uh, effective business reporting for a particular niche. Now, beyond the individual creators, we have collectives that are arising. These are groups of journalists who are working together to, to 
collaboratively create new news organizations. I'm just going to give you a couple examples. Puck is one focusing on Silicon Valley, Wall Street, Hollywood, and Washington. So they focus on four key topics, and it's a few journalists basically who have banded together to create a small new independent news organization shedding some of the bureaucracy of larger organizations. Now, this is the same kind of move that helped people leave the Washington Post to start Politico, then helped them leave Politico to start Axios, which I mentioned sold recently for $525 million, also led to other organizations launching like Punchbowl, many others. Um, here's Every, which is a new niche organization that has come together. It's a collective of independent writers and journalists who collectively are creating a new kind of news organizations that, that's growing and reaching many thousands of people, including many who pay for the privilege of reading these expert journalists on the subjects that they know and care about. The Dispatch is a political collective. So it's a few uh, people who have collectively banded together to leave news organizations to join uh, a collective that they've created, co-created, and are growing the news organization without the need for the traditional um, setup and structure that news organizations have historically had. Another area of growth in the journalism ecosystem are verticals. So these are uh, specific topic specific and geographically specific publications that uh, aim to sustainably serve the information needs of people who haven't been adequately served thus far by journalism. So to the extent that some news organizations have left people out or left certain topics out or left certain languages out or left certain niche communities out, people who have, have disabilities or people who are uh, who are unemployed or people who are in a, a an ethnic, ethnic group or racial group or a religious group or demographic group that hasn't had adequate journalism covering its needs, uh, these niche organizations are finding those gaps and serving these people who haven't been adequately served. In this case, the 19th is serving women. It's run by women for women, and it's taking a, a fresh perspective on news in an era when in the U.S., for example, abortion has been made illegal um, and uh, and this is an organization that's really serving um, watch and uh, investigating the issues that are going to affect women in, in the years ahead. They were the first ones to interview our Vice President Kamala Harris so they've already taken charge in terms of uh, gaining a strong reputation. Capital B is serving the black community in the United States with a very powerful um, approach to, to journalism that's already uh, doing quite well. The markup is focusing on technology and filling in the gaps left by major news organizations that were covering tech more as a cheerleader than as a watchdog. So their tagline, as you can see here, big tech is watching you, we are watching big tech. And this idea of holding tech accountable is a really powerful approach and one that other news organizations I think can, can learn from in terms of the coverage of technology and building up trust and providing really valuable information for readers such that they're willing and able to support that. They provide services of various kinds, including a service that lets you, for example, monitor your privacy and see if you are being watched and tracked by technology companies when you're on the web. So this is an example of a news organization creating a really useful product and showing people that they're not just producing content, they're actually producing service that helps people in their lives. The Marshall Project is a vertical focused on specifically criminal justice and focusing on this big, big issue in American life that really has been undercovered by other news organizations. And, 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 and their focus on this niche allows them to drill really deep. The information is focused on technology as well, but more focused on the business of the technology world and has done so extremely successfully and is able to charge professional users because they provide information that's really of professional value to many people in the, across the U.S. and outside, uh, outside the United States as well. In India, How India Lives has provided a data-focused approach, which really is a nice model for using data and data journalism to serve people in new ways. And in uh, covering North Korea, NK News has taken a fresh approach to focusing really narrowly on a vertical, in a vertical way, on a place that hasn't been adequately covered uh, by many news outlets around the world. Many of these news organizations are focused on a geographic niche, a demographic niche, or a psychographic niche, a topic 
for a particular group of people that's a personal or a professional passion. And by focusing on these niche areas, these organizations are able to drill really deep, are able to really clarify their focus, and are able to serve the needs of their community members, of their readers, of their viewers, of their listeners in really creative and effective ways. Finally, the, the, the fourth group I want to speak about are, are locals. These are local news organizations that are really making uh, progress in creating new kinds of journalism. The Richland Source is a good example of this. Um, they have a population of 125,000, and they are um, developing really diverse revenue streams. Um, they're using philanthropy. They're using uh, marketing services. They're helping news organizations and, and other organizations outside of the news sphere to market what they're doing more effectively as well as asking members, readers, to be members and be part of the organization and support it. So that has been an effective diversification, a revenue portfolio that has worked quite well for the Richland Source as a new kind of local organization. And many others are creating new approaches. The discourse in, in Canada has a really community-centered approach. They don't just focus on daily news, they focus on the issues in a long-term basis that are affecting a community, not just what's happening today, but what's happening every day. And they do a lot of listening to understand the needs of community members. The Green Line in Toronto is taking a new approach to local journalism, focusing on using Instagram, focusing on events, focusing on creating guides for people to, to know about what's going on in their area in creative and interesting ways, and diversifying the staff of people who are covering that place. So we have creators, we have collectives, we have verticals, and we have locals that are all doing interesting and creative new things to expand the way journalism works to strengthen the overall ecosystem. And as mid-size journalism organizations around the world continue to explore new models and new approaches, we can do well to learn from some of these lessons of the creators, of the collectives, of these verticals, and of these locals. It's not easy to apply these lessons and to move forward in a progressive, creative, innovative way. The evolution of the news industry, like evolution across industries, can be brutal. Just ask the woolly, woolly mammoth what that's like. It no longer exists. Many news organizations will fail. It's something called creative destruction, as Schumpeter put it. It's the meat industry struggling against all of these Beyond Beef, Impossible Burgers, um, meat substitutes, a lot of industries face this kind of challenge. If you look back, historically, only 52 companies remain from the Fortune 500 list of 1952. That means nine out of 10 of those companies no longer exist. This is a brutal, brutal capitalist economic world that we live in. And that's true whether you're in journalism or in any other field. We'll continue to see volatility. We'll continue to see news organizations struggling. We will see a turbulent period next uh, in the next coming years um, for, for all of the reasons that we've been talking about. And what's worked in the past will not necessarily work in the future. Those organizations that have thrived in the past won't all be the same ones that exist in a strong way 50 years hence, just as we've seen on that example of the Fortune 500. But there are some countries that are remaining quite strong in terms of the level of news interest in terms of the quality of, of, of the news ecosystem and the strength of the news ecosystem. And what I want to suggest is that we can, in many parts of the world, find the strength to be bolder in the way that we ensure our sustainability. And what would it look like for us to be bolder? What would it look like for us to focus more on the customer needs? So take the user-focused approach. Rather than looking at what we want as news organizations, focus on what the user needs actually are. And, and focusing on what value we can bring to people in specific aspects of their lives, how we can really understand who we're serving, and how we can focus on where the revenue really is and how we can capture a growing piece of it. Now, as we develop new products, we have to think about the desirability, right? Is this a real need that people have? Is this a prioritized area where we can really provide value? Can we do this? Do we have the internal strength and resources to do so? Is this viable in the sense of the business model? Do we have revenue streams that we can derive from this? And is it compatible with all of the other things that we're doing? Once we've addressed that checklist, we're moving closer to finding products and services that will help us towards sustainability. 
And we need products, not just content. So it's not just about doing more of the same, more articles, more broadcasts, um, more audio that we've done in the past. It's, it's about thinking in new ways about what this product might look like. Uh, to give you a, a sense of what I mean by that, the New York Times has published articles and reports for, for more than a century, and, and they've more recently been thinking about product innovation. So they've been thinking about creating new products and services, new apps, new kinds of services that provide value to people, like a cooking app, which has generated significant revenue along with games. People have always liked the New York Times crossword. Now there are apps and other services that provide games to people. And there are e-commerce elements. There are new audio elements. There are three new video elements, a partnership with Netflix, one with Amazon Prime and one with Hulu. And these kinds of product innovation happen and, and enable a kind of cross-subsidization, which means that these products, even though they're not necessarily hardcore, hard news all the time, they help subsidize the quality news and investigative reporting that is happening at the paper. Now, they have a lot of resources, and not all organizations have those resources that the New York Times have, but many of the organizations that I've already pointed to have much smaller sets of resources and have nevertheless created really valuable products. And, and that can happen at your organization as well. Uh, BuzzFeed has created a, a cooktop um, for, for cooking. It's, it's an example of a physical product that really challenged the boundaries of what the organization was doing. They had a very successful, tasty, um, what's called tasty uh, news brand about food. And they realized that they could layer on top of that a physical product, which was very innovative thinking and really led to a, a surge in, in revenue for, for BuzzFeed. And we can think in terms of services, not just products. These are services that uh, help people be, feel smarter, help people to be faster in the work that they do and to be safer in their lives and enjoy, and enjoy the things in their lives um, and to work more efficiently. So a service, for example, that helps people quickly assess uh, the various options available to them in their marketplace can be a service offering that really makes a difference in their lives and can complement the kinds of news products we're already offering. And that allows for this kind of cross-subsidization, which means it allows the quality news to be sustainable because the revenue is coming from some other kind of product or service. Now, one thing is starting with a simple objective when we create a new product. If we're creating, for example, a new service um, related to health, rather than just more articles about health, we might think about creating a new newsletter or a new podcast or even a new app that lets people um, gather information about a particular health issue and relate it to them and their community. Um, we should check and work with real users when we're testing these things, have an R&D, a research and development kind of mentality where we're testing products and services with real people and focusing on the frustrations that people have in their lives. What's keeping them up at night? What's problematic in their community in particular and how can we address that? So we wanna focus on new products and services and we want to focus on it in a, in a, in a uh, thoughtful, logical way. We want to start with a team, cross-functional team ideally. The New York Times had a beta unit with, uh, to create some of these new products with a product designer, with a journalist, a reporter, with a um, business person on the team as well. And you want to enable people to share effectively and collaborate effectively. You have to get to know the people in the organization as well as the people outside the organization in the community. Start with experiments, even small experiments. Engage with these early adopters who are trying out these products to figure out how they can grow. What is it about the product that's really resonating with people? Then we think about the monetization. So once we have that kind of product uh, approach in mind and we're addressing a real need, we think about potential partners who might be sponsors, who might have a stake in this market, in this terrain. Uh, we iterate on our approach. And then finally, we build that into the rest of the business that we have. In some cases, we give up on the product if it's not successful, but in other cases, we exit by incorporating that into the work that we do. We build those newsletters, for example, into the core set of offerings within a newsroom. We also focus on establishing relationships. There are many kinds of journalism that are emerging after this uh, pandemic. Solutions journalism is growing, where people focus not just on the problems, but on the solutions. Dialogue journalism, where people talk to each other across political divides. There are many other areas in which we engage people, like public power journalism, where we ask people what are the key things that they need, what are the key questions that they have, and we incorporate their interests in our reporting on a daily basis rather than just putting people in a comment ghetto 
below articles where the comments are often ignored. We give them new ways to engage with us, whether it's a mobile phone message or through a, a text messaging kind of a service. And we get them talking to us, we host real events, we gather people in the real world to the extent possible. We use data. So in some cases, we can use data to personalize information for people so that they're reading about the sports teams they actually care about. Or we allow them to customize the page so they may not see sports at all if they're primarily interested in business or science or politics. We help them prioritize by um, learning from the archives what people are searching for in the archives and providing that, making it more easily accessible to people. And we give them targeted offers. So if we know that someone's particularly interested in sports or in science or in business or whatever it is that they're interested in, we can give them targeted offers based on the data that we collect. And, and obviously this has to be with great respect and with a focus on privacy and careful, careful regulations to, to ensure that we, we're only collecting the data we, ne we need, we are um, depersonalizing the data where possible and where relevant, and we are enabling people to make choices about whether or not we can collect their data to provide them with effective services. Um, again, Denikant used the CRM um, to, to gather data really about how people were engaging with their services, and that was quite an effective step in their growth. Diversity is an important part of what we need to do to be sustainable and to thrive. We have too many journalists. This, this shows that, that, by the way, um, broadcast journalists are the ones people many, in many cases think of when they think of leading journalists. And if you look at who those broadcast journalists are, they're disproportionately male and not female in these countries and in many others. And there's a similar problem with lack of diversity from a racial perspective, ethnic perspective in many countries. And we need to address that so that the journalism we do reflects the communities that we're serving. And that's something that we haven't yet done successfully enough in many journalism organizations. And if we do so, we will better serve those people we are aiming to serve. Finally, we need to create useful technology and sorry, use useful technology. We've often focused on the hyped up technologies uh, in the past, whether it's instant articles from Facebook or the notion that blockchain would solve all of our challenges for, for journalism. We've relied on technological hype as opposed to thinking carefully about the key journalistic products and services that will allow us to make incremental innovation and, and allow us to step forward on how we create products, how we serve our community. We can use some technologies, like augmented reality, helping people understand information about places and topics that they're interested in. News organizations can help power the new glasses that Apple will release next year and other companies are already releasing. Um, we can use new delivery mechanisms to deliver information over 5G, for example, in creative ways. We can automatically translate information from other countries for our readers using new kinds of translation technology. We can create new kinds of visuals using great new camera technology, and we can use artificial intelligence in some cases to identify data outliers and stories that haven't been covered based on allowing uh, ourselves to use uh, artificial intelligence in creative ways. If we look here at uh, an example of this volumetric display, this is an example of kind of new sorts of display technologies that might help us present visual information in new ways in the years ahead. And artificial intelligence is already being used effectively by many organizations, like the Associated Press and, and Reuters, to do things like this. Uh, this was actually a BuzzFeed story where they trained a computer to search for aberrations in data, flight data, and they were able to identify spy planes that way. We need to train people with new sets of skills in product, how to create new kinds of products, new podcasts, new newsletters, in the skill of engaging people, reaching out to community members, understanding community needs, in selling people on subscriptions. These are all skills we need within news organizations to a greater extent than we have it today. And we need to continue building these skills by incorporating stronger training regimens within news organizations. I worked at a news organization for a number of years where there was almost no training provided. Uh, everyone was on their own in terms of finding their own skill building. And I think news organizations uh, need to emphasize that kind of training more, more, more substantially. We also need to think more broadly about how journalism skills are developed, not just in multimedia skills, but in the engagement skills and data and design and coding 
curation. There are lots of areas, and it's not that every journalist needs to know all of these things, but we need to recruit journalists and train them in at least one of these specialization areas so that we have news organizations full of people who have this disparate set of skills. Finally, we need to think about reaching people directly. We've relied on distribution through platforms for quite a while now. And increasingly, we have new ways of reaching people through podcasts, for example, which are growing. Through email, which is an exciting new opportunity that Axios used so successfully in growing over the five years that I mentioned. It's very convenient for people. It allows people to, to read the voice of the journalist right in their inbox, which they're accessing regularly. In Brazil, uh, as in many other countries where email newsletters are growing, uh, as many as 20% of people um, say that they, they actually access news already via email. So this is a growing opportunity. Um, not many pay for it yet. This is still a small, small percentage of people who are paying for, for uh, Substack newsletters, for example. But that number is growing, and it is already at a million in, 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 uh, in the U.S. and neighboring countries. And I suspect we'll see uh, some significant growth in this area in the years ahead. Many people will access news in many different ways in, in the years ahead. Only 23% are coming directly to a news organization's front door at this point. And so those other out areas, um, those other things, particularly for younger viewers, as this slide points out, will be increasingly important. So having a diverse representation of what we cre create on a variety of platforms will be increasingly important for us in the years ahead. In Germany, as in Brazil and elsewhere, the, the percentage of readers reading print is declining, and that should be no surprise. But that actually enables us in some ways to focus our attention on these growing areas or on these stable areas where we're able to reach people on multiple platforms, including on uh, digital platforms and on our own platforms, where we can increasingly think about creative ways to provide the products and services that people will actually pay for. So we need to think about revenue portfolios, uh, uh, not just two revenue streams where people are paying directly for the product and their advertisers are paying as well. We need to think about diversifying that to a broader array, choosing from a range of 200 revenue streams that we've written about to, um, to, to, to find just the four or five that really work as a, as a good mix. Um, Narratively is a good example of an organization that has done this using licensing, creating an agency, having sponsorship of certain content that's labeled carefully as such, creating custom content for some business partners, having a membership where people can benefit from additional parts of being in the community, attending events and paying for those events in some cases, uh, creating eBooks and additional premium content, and then doing some consulting and advising. This is an organization that has done a, a really broad range of things to, to generate revenue. And, and this is the kind of revenue portfolio that I have in mind uh, for news organizations that really want to become sustainable. There are challenges in each of these areas, right? Uh, whatever your revenue stream is, there are challenges that are associated with that. And it's not easy to do but it is possible and if we look to these points of light to these inspiring examples we can identify lessons that we can apply to our own ventures there are many questions that remain how do we handle this question of news as a public good should we be profiting from news that really is something that everyone should have universal access to some would say should we look to universities for support for to foundations to, for support to small donors, to big donors, to NGOs, nonprofit organizations? Or should we be purely focused on commercial operations? That's a big question for journalists to, to consider and to face in the years ahead. What are the right business models? I've mentioned a few revenue streams and revenue portfolio approach, but there are many, many different approaches. And, and for many organizations, there are many possibilities and many roads we could take. And that's going to be something we, we continue as individual news organizations. We're going to continue to have to navigate that complex possible terrain. Is it elitist to be offering news and charging people for one product and giving other people a, a free lesser product? Should we continue to partner with platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, like Google, <coughs> uh, and even TikTok? How should we think about our relationship with those organizations in an era where we are both competing and potentially partnering with them. Should we be doing advocacy? A lot of people in some parts of the world think we should take a clear position on climate change, for example, as news organizations. 
others are dubious of that and feel we should reflect a range of views on topics like climate change and others. That's a big question that news organizations will continue to have to wrestle with. Should we be more lean? Should we have smaller staffs and smaller cost bases, given that the revenue we're receiving is declining? <coughs> and finally, how should we think about consolidation? How should we face that? Should we fight that? What do we do about subscription fatigue when we're all asking the same group of consumers for subscriptions? Should we think about events now that the pandemic is moving into a new phase? Should we return to more in-person events, charging people for gathering? <coughs> and how should we think about new technologies like 5G and augmented reality? Will we be affected by the splinternet if countries continue to incorporate separate approaches to the internet? There are a lot of these kinds of questions that we will continue to, to face, um, but you are the next generation of, of journalism leaders and, and you will be helping us move from this notion of just surviving to thriving, to answering these questions creatively, to developing these new revenue streams creatively. And you're the ones to do so because you're looking up from the daily work and the grind. You're here participating in this kind of program. You're looking around at what's happening around your ecosystem, around the journalism ecosystem globally. You're looking back at history, journalism history, and seeing lessons to be learned from that. You're looking forward into the future of journalism and seeing what we can do that will implement a stronger future, a brighter future, a more vibrant future for our news organizations and for ourselves as individual journalists. So here are a final couple of calls to action for you. Find a partner. Find someone who you can collaborate with, you can learn with, you can work with, who you can reach out to and see the mutual benefit of, of learning together and working together. Um, we often are competing with each other as news organizations, grabbing things back and forth from one another, focusing on our com competitors. But maybe we should be thinking about new kinds of partners. Maybe we can find partners, both individuals and organizations, that we can partner with creatively for the benefit of the whole ecosystem. <laughs> so take a step back when you have a moment to reflect on this big picture and this ecosystem that you're a part of, tell the people that you're covering that you are gonna continue holding them accountable, right? I am holding you accountable is your message to those in power, right? That's a core part of who we are and how we distinguish ourselves in the ecosystem. And I'm also holding your attention, you can say to your consumers, right? You are going to be a resource for them. You are going to be valuable to them. And I want to encourage you to take a tiny step forward in the, in the days ahead um, by doing some small things, like building a spark list. What are the sources of inspiration for you when you look around at the news ecosystem? What are the newsletters? Who are the podcasters? What are the niche sites that really inspire you where there's some creative innovation happening? What's in the print arena that's creative, that's interesting, that's challenging convention? What's in the broadcast arena? that's not doing the same old, but doing something new, providing new kinds of visuals, reaching new consumers in new ways. And what's happening on social media? Who are the people with interesting voices and how are they using those platforms creatively? Look at your own strengths. Look at your own skills in new ways and look at how you can bring those strengths, your skills, your knowledge, your passion, and your personal network to help your news organization in, in new ways. And look at your own network in, in greater detail. Who can you go to to learn with, to be a part of a community where you can actually draw on the strengths and unique capacities that you have and bring those back to the news organization that needs it? There are a bunch of resources I'm going to share in an email uh, following this presentation from the New York Times Product Discovery Guide, which is a really great series of one-page handouts, to the NPR Guide, National Public Radio Guide, to creating new products in, in creative ways a toolkit for developing and thinking through products more carefully and, and creatively, and finally some new revenue models um, that we've been exploring and uh, so that you can explore different possible ways of, of making money in greater detail. I've got my own resources that I'll, I'll share as well um, that I've curated. And finally, I want to thank you for, for caring enough about this topic to put your time and your effort and your sweat into it and for listening and for thinking about these topics and wrestling with them and for being leaders, for being the kind of people who participate in a program like this, 
who go back and lead their news organization, who go back and inspire their colleagues. You will be an inspiration to others if you bring forward the messages of how we can not just survive, but thrive in the journalism ecosystem in the years to come. So thank you, and I look forward to engaging with you in, in the future and in supporting the work that you're doing in the world of journalism.